Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, we're in a, we're, now we're in a section we started last, uh, last couple times together from chapter 2 verse 14 through chapter 6 all the way through the end of chapter 6 is a, is a section about ministry, about Paul's ministry, about his message. And the, the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians are kind of hard to divide up into sections. You know, they, they, like Ephesians has is half and half and Galatians is two chapters, two chapters, two chapters and Philippians are just nice natural divisions. There's four natural divisions in the book of Romans. But the Corinthian epistles are just kind of a narrative. There are sections in it of, of specific truth, but, it's, but it's, you, it, you can't divide the book so much into sections. It's just, it's just kind of a narrative. Um, 1 Corinthians is reproof and correction. 2 Corinthians is repent, repentance and commendation. The, uh, they're babes and carnal in, in 1 Corinthians, and they've made some progress and some growth in 2 Corinthians. And, and Paul lays his heart out, as, as we've said, that there's a lot of personal information there. Um, just briefly, 14 and 15 and 16, he says, um, the section begins about ministry, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. There's total victory, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. You know, I was thinking about that verse this, this past, this past uh, two or three days, and it's, it's great to know that you can share the Lord wherever you're at. And it, it's a great joy. I had some great conversations there, and it was, uh, it was just wonderful. Uh, one lady took, the, uh, took the, the website down. She was really interested. I was hoping to have a, have a chance to talk with her again, um, but she was gone in the morning. So it was just, uh, it, it's just a one. Your ambassadorship doesn't stop if you get sick or if you have hardship or difficulty, you have the opportunity to, to, to shine the light wherever you are, and sometimes in unique places where people see different, all different kinds of reaction to uh, adversity and trials and difficulty. And uh, he says he makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that, are per that, that perish. God just loves to hear his son proclaimed. He loves his son in whom I'm well pleased, says that multiple times. So it wants him out there. Um, just preach it. Just share. Just share the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, them that are saved, we're a savor of life unto life. We, we give life. There's regeneration. There's new life given to us. And now there's the life that is and that which is to come. It's life unto life and death unto death. People who reject, who are perishing, they're dead in trespasses and sins, and they're heading towards... Um, the, the wrath of God being poured out upon him in the, in the second death. And it's not that God is pleased and God is not willing that any should perish, but the gospel going out puts the ball in their court, and God just wants everybody to know about his son because his son is such a, such a celebrity, such, a, such the, unique, the, the unique person of the universe, uh, God himself coming to this earth to manifest divine life in humanity, and then give his life to humanity, to us today in the body of Christ. To the one we're a savor of death unto death, to the other a savor of life unto life. Who is sufficient for these things? We aren't, but the message is. God put the power in the message, and our sufficiency is of God. So get the message out. Verse 17, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Don't corrupt the message. A pure message is what God wants to proclaim. You proclaim a false message or a corrupted message, it's a, it's a message that won't save somebody. They'll believe something that won't do them any good. In fact, it'll give them a false sense of security. Um, so don't corrupt the message. Many, he says, we are not as many which corrupt the word. They were corrupting preachers, preaching false error, and, and, and there's no other kind of false there's no other kind of error than false error, false doctrine. Preaching another gospel. You can take the Bible and corrupt it by preaching something that God isn't doing today. Um, it's, not the, it's not the kingdom program. It's the, it's the gospel of the grace of God. And some people were even corrupting the written text. There were false letters floating around with Paul's name on them. Um, there were the people, you ever hear people talk about lost books of the Bible? Uh, the Catholics have a whole section of extra books in the Bible that, uh, that are added to the scripture that are not God's word. People take away from God's word today. So it's, it's a common thing. 
If you don't have, if you have a corrupted book, you don't have the Word of God. It contains the Word of God, but it not, it's not the, the, the title of the Word of God. So that's where we finished up. Now chapter 3, I want to go down through the, the, fix, the first six verses to, uh, tonight. He, starting in chapter 3, verse 1, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of con, uh, commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Does Paul need validation? Does he, does he need somebody to put a stamp on his message and say, yes, that's a legitimate apostle? He's, with some people he did, because there were all kinds of people trying to discredit him and opposing him. Um, and he's writing here to the Corinthians, do you guys need commendation? Do you need validation of my and my apostleship? I, you shouldn't. Um, there's, the, the, the people were constantly diminishing and minimizing Paul's message. Go back to... Um, Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. When Paul came to, to Corinth, Corinth and, and that area in Greece, it was famous for education and knowledge and learning and the wisdom. The Greeks seek after wisdom. Paul was just a common guy off the street. He says, I didn't come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. People like the, 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 the flashy appearance, the, the, the polish and the um, uh, speak, speaking smooth like a pro. Paul was not that. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted, have no certain dwelling place, and labor, working with our own hands. Doesn't sound like the million dollar preachers of today, does it? Paul, was, Paul took the hard road. Labor, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Doesn't go tit for tat. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Comes with the territory. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscoring of all things unto this day. There's the, there's the apostle of the Gentiles and how, how little he was thought of. Because he's preaching a new message. He's not preaching established truth. He's bringing the Lord Jesus Christ in a, in a new way um, opposed by, by the nation of Israel. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. For his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. This guy's hard to listen to, and he's not much to look at. <laughs> um, people, people can find all kinds of things to criticize. And Paul was, Paul was defamed and, and, and cast down. Look at chapter 11. Chapter 11. Um, and uh, verse 16 chapter 11 and verse 16 I say again let no man think me a fool if otherwise yet as a fool receive me that I may boast myself a little people thought that, uh, that he was uh, a fool fools for Christ's sake all those things does he need that with the Corinthians um, come, back to, come back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 he's validating his po apostleship um verse 1, do, do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendations to you? Or letters of commendation from you? Do, does somebody have to, have to introduce me to you and, and, and give me validity um, coming to you? Uh, I shouldn't. Shouldn't need it with you especially. Um, because I'm, uh, he says in verse 2, ye are our epistle written in our hearts known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us. Now, people read that, and you'll hear people say, you're the only Bible that some people will read. Now, that's a, that's a great statement, because that's true. But notice, notice the verse here. Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us. See, when, when Paul says you're the epistle, 
He says, I'm bragging on you. I'm the one. You're proof of my ministry. I need validation. You guys, you believe the gospel I, I presented to you. Um, the, you. You're the ones that uh, are, are, are proof of my ministry. And I'm talking about you wherever I go. Um, and, and I'm proud of you. And you're proof of my ministry. Um, Paul talked about the Corinthians. Go to chapter 7. Go to chapter 7 and verse 14. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 14. Paul boasted to the, of the Corinthians to Titus. He sent Titus to go and visit him. He says, For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed, but as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus is found a truth. He boasted to Titus about the Corinthians, what kind of went out on a limb, and the boasting, the confidence, was validated. Um, and his inward affection towards you is more abundant towards you while he remembered the obedience of you all and how in fear and trembling you received him. Um, the response was positive. And the, the, the good optimistic report that Paul gave to Titus about the Corinthians was validated. That's just, you see Paul's optimism. You know over there in the great, uh, what's called the great love chapter, the great charity chapter, there's, there's a verse about optimism. Charity believeth all things and hopeth all things. It's, it's all about attitude, trying to think the best. Not to always look for, the, look for the worst side of things. Attitude is everything. Verse 16, I rejoice therefore. I have confidence in you in all things. That's optimism. Um, you know, he was, he was scared that he overdid it and talked a little bit too rough to them. And he gets the good report. And he says, well, you know, I'm, you, guys, you guys came through with, with flying colors. Look at chapter 9. Um, chapter 9 and verse 2. Remember Paul is collecting this offering for the, uh, for the saints in Jerusalem? 2 Corinthians 9 verse 1. For his touching the ministering to the saints. It is superfluous for me to write unto you. It's unnecessary. For I know the forwardness of your mind. I know you guys have good intentions. For which I boast of you. To them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago. Your zeal hath provoked very many. So Paul, Paul talked up the Corinthians, and it inspired the Macedonians to come through with their portion. Paul had a great sense of optimism. Uh, he loved the Corinthians and, and uh, loved his churches. And uh, he doesn't need validation. They're his validations. They're the seal of, uh, as of, his, of his apostleship are them in the Lord. He bragged upon him. Um, verse 3, then, back to chapter 3. Chapter 3, for as much then, verse 3, 3-3, three, three, for as much then are you, as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Where is the, the, the Spirit of God? It's in the fleshly tables of the heart. And he talks about this thing about the Spirit. Um, the Spirit of the living God. Um, you guys are saved people. The Spirit is in your hearts. That's proof of your apostles. You got the Spirit of God through my message. You received the, Spirit of, you received the message and you received the Spirit of God. And the Spirit is in your hearts. Verse 4 and such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Uh, I know you guys are saved. You guys have received the Spirit. You're the seal of my apostleship. I know that he saved you. I have confidence in Christ, and I have confidence in the gospel. He says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is where? It's of God. We trust the Lord. We trust him. We trust his gospel and what he does. Um, 
The Corinthians were saved people. They validated Paul's ministry. He bragged about them. They were proof that he was a legitimate apostle. And he says, and, that's, and, and such trust have we through Christ to Godward. We trust him. We trust the gospel and what God does. It's him holding on to you, him holding on to us, not us holding on to him. Um, I want to take just a couple of minutes and talk about this confidence. The Corinthians weren't living like saved people a lot of times, but Paul knew that they were saved. And the, the, the great truth of eternal security, once saved, always saved. You can't lose your salvation. I was talking to the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, paramedic and uh, uh, asked him if he knew for sure his sins were forgiven. He says, yeah. I says, Can you, do you think you could ever lose your salvation? He says, oh, I try to stay on the right track. I know you can backslide. Um, you know, and we all do. So on the one hand, he says, I know I'm saved. No, no, no doubt about it. But I try to stay on the right path, and, and, and we can backslide. So I know that there are times, because you, you're, you're, you're saying both things. And the, the, the truth of eternal security is based not in us. Our sufficiency is not in ourselves, in ministry or in eternal life. We say that eternal life is what? It's a free gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know why people doubt their salvation? You ever doubt your salvation? Sometimes I think, you know, what if this thing isn't really true? <laughs> you know, or, man. But you know, you know why people doubt their salvation? Because they look at themselves. There's something in themselves that they don't think... They didn't believe enough, or they didn't measure up enough, or there's just something that, that's, that's just not right. You're looking at yourself. When you look at yourself, there's always room for doubting. So where do you look at? You look at God and the gospel, and you believe the gospel. You be, believe the truth. Paul knew that these people were saved. You know how you know you're saved? Go back to, go back to Romans chapter 5. Well, go, go to 1 Corinthians first. Go back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The great, the great statement on the gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. What did he preach? I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now there's the gospel that he preached. And he says, I preach the gospel to you in verse 1, which ye have received. So did they accept the message? Yes. And wherein ye stand. They stood in the message. So guess what? They were saved people because of the gospel. Now, just take a second and look at verse, verse 2 kind of seems a, con a, a contradiction, doesn't it? By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So do we have to remember the gospel? What if we forget? What if we turn our back? Do, do we lose our salvation if we don't keep it in memory? Listen, the saved, if they receive the gospel and they stand in the gospel, they're saved people, the salvation there is a different kind of salvation. It's a salvation from the, from the down pole of the world. You're saved if you keep, you're saved from the, from the deception, you're saved from the discouragement. And he goes on to talk about the resurrection. The resurrection life that we have, uh, it's a different save from despair and destruction. Keep on keeping on. Walking in God's word and resting in the truth of it will keep you on the right path. You abandon the gospel and you don't lose your salvation, but you can get you, you can make a lot of trouble for yourself. And he says we're saved um, if we keep it in memory. You have to walk in it day by day. Paul told the Galatians that you, that you've been saved, and God hath delivered you from this present evil world. Do people get sucked into the world and and end up in destruction and 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 problems and difficulty? Yeah, they walk away from the gospel. They don't lose their salvation, but the world just eats them up. Um, it's like that widow over there in Timothy. She's, she's dead while she liveth. She's
she's cast off her first first faith um, but the Corinthians stood in the gospel um, go to the book of Romans go to the book of Romans chapter 3 you know how you're saved because God's word says it Romans chapter 5 you, you believe the, go the gospel is about him and what he's done and you just accept it Romans chapter 5 verse, verse 1 therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ we have peace with God why by our keeping on keeping on by our keeping in memory no we we have it lock stock and barrel the moment we get we get saved we have that's from God's angle towards us by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand now we stand in the grace you know how we have access to it we access it by faith it's there we stand in it the Corinthians received the gospel and they stood in the gospel they were in Christ and they, they stood in grace and we stand in grace and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God and not only so but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us didn't Paul say that the, the, the Corinthians had the Spirit in their hearts you know what the Spirit the Spirit's job what the Spirit does is he confirms God's love to us how does he confirm God's love through the gospel the love of God is shed abroad in, by our, in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which was given to us how do we know that verse 6 for when we were yet without strength in due time Christ died for the ungodly Christ died for us when we were weak when we couldn't save ourselves. verse 8 but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us in our weakness we couldn't in our sinfulness we were constantly missing the mark you know what sin is sin is aiming at the target of the righteousness of God and missing I fell short the air, I'm aiming at the, at the righteousness of God but it, we fall, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God a sinner is somebody who misses the mark doesn't hit the target and when we are missing the mark and, and, and falling short how do we know God commends his love toward us when we were missing the mark. Christ still died for us. Not only were we weak, not only were we missing the mark, he says in verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Not only in our weakness, not only in missing the mark, but we were even fighting against him, opposing him. Guess what? God still loved us. Christ still died for you. So if he loved you when you were weak and you were missing the mark and you were even fighting against him, how much more does he love you when you accept him? See, for we were without strength, Christ died for us. But God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. If he loved us when we were missing the mark and falling short, and targeted for the wrath how much more does he love us now through the gospel justified by his blood it's what he did that gives us confidence that gave, gives, gives us confidence that we know that, that we're saved verse 10 for if when we were enemies we were, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life how much more now once we've received him and he's accepted us See how the love is greater? He loved you when you couldn't, when you didn't, and you wouldn't. <laughs> and he loves you now because you did. <laughs> you trusted him. And our salvation is sure, not because of what we've done. It's not us holding on to him. It's not us trying to stay on the right path. And, <coughs> excuse me, and trying not to backslide. It's him holding on to us because he loves us because Christ died for everything that's wrong with us and put us in a right relationship with him that's terrific 
That's what the Spirit, God put the Spirit in our hearts, and that's what the Spirit does. And because, because of what God has done for us, we have peace and we stand in grace. And we are eternally secure. Go back to 2 Corinthians. Well, he's given us the Spirit there in verse 5 in our hearts. Look what the Spirit is. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Eh, go get, get chapter 1. Here's what, what the Spirit does is he confirms God's love to us through the gospel. Here's what the Spirit is. He's given us the Spirit. First Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 22, who hath sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. You know what earnest money is? It's a down payment. You, have, you put money down on a car, you put money down on a house while they do all the paperwork. It's, it's, a, it's an expression of your good faith that you're going to come through with the rest of the money to make the purchase. It's a pledge. Well, you know, whoop de doo for that. Sometimes our, our, our promise isn't always good. We have a pledge, we have a down payment from God to us that he's going to finish the deal. He, he, put, he, put, uh, he put the Spirit in our hearts as a down payment saying, I'm going to finish the thing. I'm giving you the first installment and there's more to come. That's great. And it's, it's a down payment from the God who cannot lie. He's faithful. First, 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 22. Go to chapter 5. Go to chapter 5. Verse 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5. Now he that hath wrought for us the selfsame thing is God, who hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. God gave you a down payment. God gave you a pledge of, on, on his authority, on his good name, that he's going to finish the deal. That's why you're secure. It's not you holding on to him. It's, it's by, by her, <laughs> he, he knew what he was getting right up front. And he says, I'll take it. <laughs> He's mine. And you were purchased with the shed blood. The value you have is not your good works or the amount of your faith. The value you have is what it costs to redeem our soul. That was the blood of his son. What a glorious thing. He paid, he, it was sufficient and it satisfied God. Um, so God can then give you a down payment and say, you, until then, <laughs> but there's coming a future. Go to, go to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. This, what, the Spirit confirms God's love to us through the gospel, but the Spirit is also a down payment and a pledge. Look at what he says to the Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. In whom... Ye also trusted. You trusted in Christ, verse 12, in whom ye also trusted. After that, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So what came first? You heard the gospel, and then what would you do? After you heard the gospel, you trusted Jesus Christ. Verse 13, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were what? Sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. He's given to you, but he is your seal. You are wrapped up in the, by the Spirit of God and placed into the body of Christ, and he is our seal. Verse 14, which is the earnest, there's that word again, of our inheritance, how long? Until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. That Redemption there is the redemption of our body. That's when this body is going to be set free from the bondage of corruption and we're going to be given a brand new body. You're, you're sealed under the day of redemption. That's the rapture, beloved. And if we die before the rapture comes, guess what? We're still guaranteed that new glorified body because we have, we have a pledge from God. We have a down payment 
we have collateral <laughs> given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, or by, by God the Father. And uh, go to chapter 4 of Ephesians. Chapter 4, yeah, Donna knows where I'm going. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. He says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Now that, he says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. You know, how, how do we grieve the Spirit of God? We fail. He's, he, he's given us total victory. Can we make God unhappy? Absolutely. Should we? We should try not to. But he says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed. There's a verse that says we can disappoint God, but we're still sealed unto the day of of redemption. You can't get out no matter how hard you try. <laughs> That's wonderful. We are secure in Christ Jesus. That's what the Spirit is. I'm not holding on to Him. He's got me. Go to 2 Timothy chapter number 1. I just, you know, these sometimes it's good just to go over these verses again. 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse 12. Here's Paul's confidence in Timothy and, um, and God's faithfulness. He says, for which cause I suffer these things? Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. He's able to keep it. He's, gonna, he's not going to lose anything. He's going to keep it because he's faithful. Uh, he's faithful. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Here's some verses about our service. Um, verse 11. It's a faithful saying. It's a true saying. If we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Are we crucified with Christ? Absolutely. So if we're dead with him, we're going to live with him. If we suffer, we shall reign with him. We suffer for the gospel, we'll reign with him. If we deny him, uh-oh, he also will deny us. Deny us our salvation? No, it's the issue of denying us reigning with him. Um, God desires us to be faithful. But look at verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. You see what it just what what the what the scripture just called you? Just called he says we're flesh of his flesh and bone of his bones. We're members of his body. I can't deny my hand. <laughs> you know why? Cuz it's part of me. It's myself. You you stepping on my foot, you're stepping on me. <laughs> you know, it's like your kids can't deny they're mine <laughs> you know there's a, there's a relationship there there's an eternal relationship if we believe not he cannot deny himself that's how saved you are how much you stand in the gospel that's how how powerful the gospel is go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19 2 Timothy 2, verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. You know what the foundation, what's the foundation? The foundation is Jesus Christ. And we build on top of that foundation, and the, the foundation's going to last. Um, the gold, the silver, the precious stone, or the wood, hay, and the stubble, that stuff will be burned up. But the foundation doesn't get burned up because the foundation standeth sure. And if you're in Christ, God, you're His. And uh, there, there's no going back. He doesn't put you on probation. I shared that with that guy. He, he also, the, the EMT, he worked, he worked in the jail. This is a busy guy. He's been, been an EMT for 47 years, right out of high school. He, he, he's an EMT, and he works at the jail. And then he teaches EMT classes. I don't know when he sleeps. 
<laughs> he was working third shift. But you know, um, probation. I wish I'd have thought about it. You know, I mean, I, I use the thing probation, but he knows working at the jail, there's people that when you break your probation, guess what? You go back into Huskow. <laughs> now, not with the, he doesn't give you probationary life. He doesn't save you and say, okay, now maintain X, Y, and Z, and you'll make it. You'll retain your freedom. No. That's a, that's a great truth. Um, Paul, was, Paul was confident with the Corinthians. And uh, go, back to, go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Such trust, verse 4, have we through Christ to God work. It's through Jesus Christ. Paul's confidence was what Jesus Christ did for them, and his faith was in God. And he says, I'm, I'm bragging on you. You're known and your your epistles known and read of all men. I'm, I'm bragging on you, and and you're my apostleship in the Lord. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And it's and it's his faithfulness. He is faithful. Aren't you glad? I mean, uh, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Sometimes we're unfaithful, but he cannot deny himself. He's given you his word. He cannot lie. If he told you, you can take that to the bank, you know. And it's his bank, not, not consumers or <laughs> First National or any of that. Um, because he's going you put, to, you, you put things in his trust and it's, say, it's for safekeeping. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. So Paul is, Paul is validating his apostleship with the confidence that he has in the Corinthians. And I'm bragging on you, and I'm optimistic for you. And some of my, my bragging has, has come true, and I'm, I'm proud, and I've spoken highly of you to Titus and to the Macedonians. And our sufficiency is of God. Now, I come to verse 6. This is all the farther we're going to go, but it's going to take a little time. Verse 6 is a verse of controversy. Okay? Um, verse 6 our sufficiency is of God who hath made us able ministers of the new testament not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter killeth but the spirit giveth life the new testament is really like talking about the new covenant now just quickly, do you know the difference between a testament and a covenant? One is a promise and Very good. If you didn't hear what she said, one is a promise. A promise beforehand, like a marriage covenant. You make a, you, you give vows to your to your spouse, and it's a it's a covenant, it's an agreement between two people that are made beforehand, ahead of time. Go to Hebrews. Let me show you this. Go to Hebrews. Um, chapter 7 I believe it is a testament is something that goes in effect it's an agreement but it's not activated until death like your last will and testament you you make an agreement you you make a promise but that promise doesn't go in effect until the death of the guy who makes the covenant um, or make, makes, the, makes, the, makes the agreement, the testament. Um, Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, no, make it chapter 9. Wrong chapter. Hebrews chapter 9. Um, verse 15. Talking about Jesus Christ. For, for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament... They which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. The, the testament is a promise of eternal inheritance. Now, what the, the first covenant, that was conditional, wasn't it? And they broke it. He says, but they who are, are uh, but the first testament that, that they might call might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force when? After men are dead. Otherwise there's no strength at all while the testator liveth. It goes into effect and it becomes active at the death of the guy who made the, the, 
Testament. Well, when Jesus Christ, he says, this is the blood of the New Testament in my blood. Um, and what it was, it was the blood of the New Covenant. God made the promise in the covenant, but it was a promise that became active when he died. Now, so, so go, back to, go, go back to 2 Corinthians. The controversy in this verse is, is that people read this verse and say Paul is preaching Israel's New Covenant, New Testament blessing. Well, you, you look at the verse, who hath made us able ministers of the what? Of the New Testament. So people say, okay, this is where people get the idea that Paul preaches the kingdom gospel because it's the New Testament. And then it says, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter killeth. And they say, the let, you know what, the letter that killeth, that's the law, right? And so he's not ministering the old covenant, he's ministering the new covenant. So hence Paul is preaching Israel's program in these early books. And... Uh, he says, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. But the ministration of death, there's the law written and written and graven in, in stones, was glorious. You see how, how people could try to make that link? I see John is kind of squinting a little bit. He said, you know, that, I don't understand that. The problem is that's not what the verse says. Okay? Notice what the verse says. Who hath made us able ministers of the new Testament, okay, there's the New Testament in Christ's blood, not of the letter, comma, the letter of what? The New Testament. He's not preaching the letter of Israel's New, New Testament. He's preaching the spirit of it. What's the spirit of the New Covenant? Like we, we would talk about the spirit of the Constitution. We're not quoting it word for word, but we're saying the spirit of the Constitution is life and, and liberty in the pursuit. I just quoted it. But it's the issue is freedom and, and limited government and, and personal responsibility and, and go be all you can be. That's the spirit, but it's not the specific. Go back, to, go back to Romans chapter 15. Notice what Paul is talking about here when he talks about the spirit of the New Testament, the spirit of Israel's new covenant. First, uh, Romans chapter 15, verse, well, you can get verse 26 and 27. It hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution to the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Who are the poor saints at Jerusalem? It's that little flock, right? Those people that are, that are in Israel's new covenant. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have made, been made partakers of their spiritual things, the spiritual blessings of the new covenant. What's the spiritual blessings of the new covenant? Isn't it forgiveness of sins? Doesn't God say, you'll be my people and I'll be your God? There's fellowship and there's relationship and there's inheritance. See, the spirit, the spirit of the new covenant is forgiveness and relationship and fellowship with God. And see, we get that. We get spiritual, but we don't get it by covenant, do we? God made no promises to the Gentiles. We get it by God's grace. We get spiritual blessings. We get fellowship and communion and relationship with God. That's the spirit of it, not the letter. Because you know what, if you, preach, if you preach the letter of Israel's spiritual blessings and covenant, the, the, like, the le, like the specifics of it, that message don't work. Israel's spiritual covenant and spiritual testament is a, is a spiritual program to take them through the tribulation period. It's, an, it's a divine empowerment to become and to overcome and to make it through the wrath to come. And when did Israel get their sins forgiven anyway? When are Israel's sins blotted out? When are they totally forgiven? At the second coming. When are our sins blotted? We get it right now. See, that, But it's the spirit of Israel's program, the spirit of Israel's blessing, not the letter of it. He's not preaching the Sermon on the Mount. 
and Israel's spiritual blessings concerning the little flock, he's teaching the spirit of it. The spiritual. We partake of the spiritual blessings that Israel is going to get in the future. We get them right now as members of the body of Christ, not an earthly kingdom, but a home in heaven. That's what he's talking about here. And so people take this verse. I heard a guy on the radio on live just last night. Another guy going saying, "Well, this is this is Paul talking about the little flock. He's preaching Israel's new covenant." So that means Paul here in Corinthians, in his in these Corinthian, in these early epistles in the book of Acts, he's preaching to the Jews and to the little flock, and he preaches to the body of Christ later in those prison epistles. This is Paul's this is Paul's gospel and ministry in the book of Acts, preaching Israel's program, Jesus is the Christ. And they, they cherry pick verses and stuff like this, and they say, this is the little flock, and this is the body of Christ, and this is the little flock, and this. And all of a sudden, the whole book is, is all muddied up. And that's not what the verse says. And they, I just heard the guy last night, he says, Paul has two ministries. He has a ministry during the book of Acts, and he's preaching Israel's, Jesus is the Christ, because he's going to the Jew first, to the Jew first, to the Jew first, right? All the way in the book of Acts. But, when, but Israel falls, and the salvation is to the Gentiles, and you get, after the close of the book of Acts, you got the prison epistles, and Paul's now preaching the mystery to the body of Christ. I don't read about Paul having two ministries. I don't read about Paul having two gospels. He preached one gospel, he preached the gospel, the grace of God that opens up the door of faith to the Gentiles and spiritual blessings and forgiveness right now and full spiritual life right now. And uh, it's, just, it's, it's just crazy. Um, we have spiritual life now. What's he said? We, we make, this, this, this make manifest the savor of his knowledge. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. What did Paul preach? He preached the spiritual blessings of the new covenant for the Gentiles now, not by covenant, but by grace. What did he preach? First Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. What's the ministry? Verse 3. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. What gospel is he preaching? His gospel. Our gospel. Go to chapter. Um, go to chapter eleven. Chapter eleven. Verse three. First, Second Corinthians eleven, verse three. For I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. For he that if he that cometh preaches another Jesus which we have not preached, or another spirit, which we have not preached, or uh, another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Another gospel, another spirit, another Jesus. You know what Jesus that is? That's the kingdom Jesus. That's the circumcision Jesus. That's the, another spirit is the spirit of bondage in the law program. And another gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. Paul didn't preach... Israel's program. He preached his gospel. And um, there's just a, there's a whole bunch of other verses. Galatians. It's the gospel uh, that he preached among the Gentiles. The gospel that calls him into the grace of Christ. And uh, he tells Timothy, preach no other doctrine. Um, go over there. Go to, go to 1 Timothy. And this same guy, one of them, says Paul uh, as he ministered to Timothy, Timothy was a little flocker. He was a member of the kingdom program. It's goofy. So what does he tell Timothy? Timothy's a little flocker helping him preach to Israel. Verse 3, 1 Timothy 1, verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. What's the other doctrine? Don't give heed to fables and endless genealogies. You know what the doctrine is? Go down to verse 11. According to the blessed, the, the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. 
There was one gospel given to the Apostle Paul, and it was committed to his trust, and that was the doctrine that Timothy was supposed to teach. So how is he going to be teaching a different gospel through the book of Acts and now teaching another different gospel here later on in his life? It makes no sense at all. Verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, that he counted me faithful, putting me into the what? The ministry. That's, that's Saul's salvation. He didn't have two ministries. He didn't have a ministry that he was put into in the book of Acts and then a ministry that he was put in after the book of Acts. <coughs> Excuse me. One gospel. Um, this, uh, this idea that you've got to split up these early epistles just makes a mess. And that verse right there, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, when you don't read it right, they say Paul's preaching the little flock gospel, the, the New Testament. It's, uh, but that's not what the verse says. The verse says he's preaching the spirit of it, not the letter. You know what? You preach the, you preach the letter of the kingdom gospel, and you just made the gospel of Christ of none effect. And you plugged into a program that doesn't work for us. It's a program that's designed to work out in the future. Um, so this is not little flock doctrine. Um, and you don't take and you start chopping up First and Second Corinthians and you, they chop up the book of Romans. They say Romans 7 is written to the Jews because Paul says you know the law. Well, he's using an illustration of the, the law of a marriage, the husband and wife. But they say, no, Gentiles don't know the law. He's talking to the Jews there. It's just... This just doesn't make any sense at all. And they chop up the Bible. Uh, a verse like this, it's a wonderful verse. Um, Paul's preaching the spiritual truths of the new covenant and making those spiritual blessings available to the Gentiles, not as a part of Israel's kingdom, but as a part of the body of Christ there. And uh, the letter of the kingdom program killeth just like the law kills because there's no spiritual life in Israel's program because that's not what God's doing God's working through the spirit of God and the body of Christ and the doctrine that Paul preached he avoided the little flock lest he should build on another man's foundation he says so it's just, it's just goofy um, so I'm going to stop there and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue on Paul's talking about the, uh, his ministry as compared to the ministration of death, which is the law, and uh, the, the excellency of his message and ministry, and how it works, and how it transforms um, our lives, and how, it's, uh, how it works as compared to, to Israel's program. Um, but it's a, it's a great thing. The, uh, we're secure, and we have spiritual life and spiritual blessings now full. God blesses us up front. Aren't you glad? Amen. I said, you got it all. You're secure. Now go demonstrate how much it means to you. And can you abuse it? Yeah. If you couldn't, it wouldn't be grace. <laughs> Don't, though. Don't use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Let you, by love, serve one another. By love, serve him. Amen? Okay. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the time we can look into this. and uh, We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for the security that we have in Christ. The optimism that you have. You're on the sidelines cheering us on, Lord, because you love us. We're yours. And you desire, us, you desire to see us succeed. You've given us everything we need to succeed. Father, we just walk and live in the reality of who we are in Christ Jesus, we thank you for the wonderful message that we have today in the age of grace. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.